for this, the next one that we are going to be working on is this species of fox. There we go. Now, usually when you're looking at something, instead of having a doubling time like we're used to, the other thing that we can look at is we can look at something that continuously grows or decays. So if you're going to be using E instead of two for your formula, one of the words that you need to look out for is relative growth. So in the problem, they'll state the relative growth or another word that they'll use is continuous. So basically, if you see either of those words, relative or continuous, that's a good indication that you're going to have to use this formula. Now, it's kind of hard to see the formula here because the printer has been broken for over a year. But the formula is that you take your initial value, which we call n naught, and you multiply it by e raised to the rt where R is going to be the rate at which something's growing continuously, and T is going to be whatever the time is. Now, one more key thing to notice about the formula is that it says exponential growth, but it also works for exponential decay. There's just one variable that changes very slightly, and that variable is the rate. So what do you guys think happens to the rate when something's decaying? It would be negative. So something's growing, are positive, paying, or would be negative. <clears throat> All right. So the first one is a certain species of fox has a relative growth rate of 8% per year and grows continuously. It is estimated that the population is 20 or in 2013 was 18,000. So what I would like you guys to do is to find a function that models that population uh, size two years after 2013. So go ahead and take a second to take a look at that. Okay, and when you have that formula done, I just want you to put your hands in the air like you just don't care. That looks very non-caring. I like it. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> Good. Awesome. Good. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love doing the wave, by the way. Do you guys know what the wave is? When you're in like a stadium or something and then they do the wave. Oh my God, that's almost better than the concert. I, I love cooperative shenanigans. So <laughs> like the wave is one of my favorite things. All right. So hopefully what you guys got for that formula is N of T, which is going to tell you the population after T amount of years, equals, well, we have an initial population of 1,800 or 18,000, excuse me, times E. Remember, E is not a variable. It's actually a number. It's 2.71 da da da. Raised to the, now this is the, the biggest thing that people goop up on, is 8%. We have to write that as a decimal for it to work in our formula. So it would actually be 0.08 T. All right, looking good so far? Awesome. So the next question wants us to estimate the Fox population in the year 2021. So. What we're going to be doing is that we're going to be plugging a number in for T, and what number are we going to be plugging in for our T value? <gasps> you guys didn't fall for it. I've had so many people plug in 2021 and they're like, whoa. I'm like, mm. So we're going to plug in eight because that's the number of years since 2013. So we're going to have 18,000 E raised to the 0 0.08 times eight. And if we plug that into our calculator, roughly what we would expect the population to be would be 
137. Rounding. <clears throat> The parts are good. So, the next question is if 300 milligrams of radioactive element decays to 180 milligrams in 36 hours, did we do this one already? No? Okay. What is the half life of the element? So, here's the deal is when we look at this problem, I know that my initial amount is 300. I know my final amount is 180. I also know that my T variable is 36 hours. And what they want me to solve for is they want me to find out what the half-life of the element is. So half-life is A, and that's the variable I'm trying to solve for. One last thing before you move too far into this. <clears throat> 36 hours is kind of a big clunky number. Does anybody know another measure of time that we could use instead of 36 hours? Yeah, a day and a half, right? Let's go ahead and change that 36 hours to 1.5 days. So since we're talking about half-lives here, what the initial formula is going to be is it's going to be 180, equals 300 times one half raised to the 1.5 divided by A. All right, now what we need to do is that we need to run through this and we need to solve for A. <clears throat> so, um, I'm going to go ahead and do this because I want to give you guys enough time towards the end of class to work on your exam. Is that okay? Is anybody super mad that they're not going to be able to work on this on their own? Okay. Yes. This one? So if you're looking at doubling time, then the formula is N naught two to the T over A. But if you're looking at half time, then it's, yeah. You're welcome. It's definitely worth remembering and writing down again, for sure. <clears throat> All right, so if I wanna solve this guy, the first thing I need to do is I need to work on getting that base by itself, which would be this guy right here. So I'm gonna divide both sides by 300. So when I divide both sides by 300, what I'm going to end up getting is three fifths equals one half raised to the 1.5 over A. Now there's two different ways that you can go about getting that A out of the exponent, right? You can either rewrite it as a log or the other thing that you can do is that you can take the natural log of both sides. Okay. I'm going to take the natural log of both sides because that is a, it's a good habit to get into because it always works. So this is going to be the natural log and the natural log. Now, why did I take the natural log of both sides? Why is that such a cool thing? Because you get to take this exponent and drop it out. Yeah, that is going to be such an amazing tool you guys are going to get when you go into calculus. 
if you forget everything else from this class, including my name, that's totally cool. Just remember that. Okay. So when we take that and we drop it out the front, what it becomes is it's going to become the natural log of three fifths equals 1.5 divided by A times the natural log of one half. All right, now I think my other class got to this problem on Monday. And it was so funny because I'm walking around the room and I let them work on this on their own. And they were like crushing it, crushing it, crushing it. And then they got to this point and they're like, the A is in the bottom. I don't know what to do. And I was like, I feel you. Every time I solved a problem and the A was in the bottom, I was like, that's this problem was not happening. So the quick thing that I would do is if I don't like an A in the denominator, I can get rid of it. And the way I can get rid of it is just by multiplying both sides by A, right? So I multiply both sides by A. And when I do that, I'm gonna end up with A natural log of three fifths equals 1.5 times the natural log of one half. And then the universe makes sense again because I can get A by itself. What do I need to do to both sides? What do you guys think? Is Tyler right? Absolutely. Good job. And there we have our answer. <clears throat> now, here's the deal. I have been a mathematician for like 15 years now. And it's hard for me to look at that answer and ask myself my favorite question, which is, does it make sense? So if I want to know if this answer makes sense, what I would do is I would put this in my calculator and just see what it equals and see if that answer makes sense. So if I plug that into my calculator and I get the decimal approximation, what I get is that A is roughly about 2.035. So does about two days make sense for the half-life for this element? Yeah, and let's think about why. Well, we initially started out with 300 milligrams. So this says in two days, we should have about 150. And that makes sense because a day and a half gave us 180. So a little bit more than half, which makes sense because it's a little bit less than a half life away. So I think this one makes some sense. <clears throat> All right, before we move on to almost the last problem, does anybody have any questions on that guy? Feeling good? All right. So the count in a culture of bacteria was 400 after two hours and 25,600 after six hours. So what we have is that we have two different data points, one after two hours and one after six hours. The question we want to ask is what is the relative birth rate of bacteria? Which makes sense. We usually don't get to see something right when it happens. We usually see it after it's already been growing and time's passing. So what I'm going to do for this one is I'm just going to write down the two formulas for the two data points that I have. I have one at two hours, I have one at six hours. So using that 400 after two hours, I can write down the formula 400 equals, well, I don't know how many we initially started off with. E to the R times two. So I also don't know the relative growth rate, but I do know that it was after two hours. And similarly, for the 25,600, 
we had 25,600. Still don't know the initial amount. And I still don't know the growth rate, but I do know that it happened after six hours. So this is actually kind of nice because I have two variables that I don't know. I don't know the initial amount. I also don't know the rate at which the factory is growing. But I do have two states. So way, way, way back from week one, we talked about how you can go about solving a system of equations. Like when you have two equations with two unknowns. So when I first started doing this, I said, I'm going to subtract them. And I did. And I was like, and nothing else. So the next thing that I did is I did the substitution method. So I'm going to solve this guy for n naught. I'm going to use that, plug it in here, so that I only get one variable. So if I solve this guy for n naught, my initial amount, I'm going to get e to the r times 2. Divide that out. So then I get that my initial amount is equal to 400 divided by e to the r times 2. Now what I can do is that I can take that right hand side of this equation and I can substitute it in for this initial amount right here, this n naught. So I'll end up with 25,600 equals and instead of n naught, remember we're writing 400 divided by e to the r times 2. And then that whole thing times e to the r times 6. Now, this is actually going to simplify out really nice. So, this is going to be. 25,600 equals 400. Now, if I have e to the r times 2 on the bottom, and I'm multiplying by e times r to the 6 on top, remember, I can rewrite that as e to the 6r minus 2r. So what's 6r minus 2r? Yay! Nailed it. Awesome. And then from here, we want to solve for R, so what would the next step be? Almost. Right, we want to get the base by itself. So divide by 400, and then we would do the natural log. So that'd be 64 equals e to the 4r. Now, if we write this like a natural log, that is awesome because our base is e. So that would be the natural log of 64 equals 4r. So the rate at which this bacteria is growing or decaying is going to be natural log of 64 divided by 4, which, if you approximate it, would be roughly 1.0397. Now, really quick before we get to the very last problem in this section, which is my favorite. 
Um, is there a way that we could use this information to figure out what the initial amount of bacteria was in the scrub? Yeah. So remember, we solved for that right here. So if we want to know what the initial amount is, we would just have to take R and plug it in right here to figure out what the initial amount was, which is pretty cool. So let's just do that real quick. Yep. And then we're going to move on to the other question because it's awesome. I'm just super excited about it. So we initially started off with roughly 50 bacteria in this culture. All right, let me know when you guys are ready to go to Newton's lab cooling. Awesome, good. All right, so here is the basic idea between Newton's law of cooling. <clears throat> In physics, heat only travels one way, okay? So things lose heat, and then what happens is that they lose heat, something else has to absorb it, right? So it's like one directional flow of heat. That's why I'm um, like cold fusion is uh, pseudoscience because it implies that cold flows when it doesn't have a flip. Anyway, won't get too into it. So what Newton's law of cooling says is if you place an object that's hot in a room, then it's going to cool down, lose heat until it reaches the same temperature as the room. Make sense? Okay. So what happens is that different objects have a different constant, and that constant is going to depend on what kind of object it is. So I said this before, but you know when you get into your car on a hot day, the seat belt is definitely a lot hotter than the fabric of your seat. That's because they're different items, so they absorb heat at a different rate, right? If you left them in the sun at the exact same temperature long enough, they would eventually become the same temperature. So here is the formula for Newton's love cooling. What you do is that you take the temperature of the surroundings. So the, uh, man, there's like a cool word for it. I can't remember. Man, whatever. So you take the initial temperature of the surroundings, and then you add not the temperature of the object, but the temperature difference, right? So if you put a hundred degree cup of coffee in a room at 70 degrees, how far does that temperature have to travel to reach room temperature? 30 degrees. Right? And then you multiply it by a decaying constant. So it's constantly losing heat until it reaches the same temperature of the room. So here's the dealio. Immediately following death, a body begins to cool and the initial body temperature is 98.6 roughly. So if we use Newton's law of cooling and we know that the constant for a body is K equals 0 0.1947. We assume that time is measured in hours and that the temperature of the surrounding room is 60 degrees. We want to first find a model that is going to tell us the temperature T hours after death. And then we wanna figure out if the body is now 80 degrees, how long ago did death occur? Okay, yes. Oh yeah, of course. So, Like so. T sub S plus D sub not E to the negative KT. You're welcome. Man, I'm so blown that I can't remember the name for surrounding temperature. 
Ambient temperature. Ah, oh, thank you. Bless you, sir. All right, ambient temperature. Awesome. So we want to find a function that models the temperature after death. So T sub S is going to be the ambient temperature. So great. Which is going to be the temperature of the surroundings. So that's going to be 60 degrees. Now, what D not is, is it's not the temperature of the body, it's the temperature difference between the body and the ambient temperature. So if the body is usually 98.6 degrees and the room temperature is 60 degrees, then the difference between those two is going to be 38.6. And then our K, which they gave us, is 0 0.1947. So now that we have all of that information, we're going to, we're going to take that information, we're going to plug it into that formula. So capital T is going to equal 60 plus 38.6 e to the negative 0 0.1947 All right. I'm going to say something. I need to make sure you guys are listening. You listening? What a great question for a final exam. Is <laughs> oh man, I need to post the other recording from the other day. And I'm avoiding it because I actually have to listen to it and swipe a little bit because I dropped the F bomb in class. <laughs> But you guys remember why I got the F-bomb in class on Monday? Because I said how much I love you. Yeah. That, yeah, you guys don't even remember, but I was like, listen, <laughs> the world is garbage and I F and love you. And now it's like on record and I need to get that off so I don't get fired for being inappropriate. <laughs> I have ten years All right. <laughs> so what I want you guys to work on now is the body now 80 degrees. We have to figure out how long ago is it going to be. So I want you guys to take a whack at that. I thought maybe you already had it done. I'm super excited for you. Here. So after I identified what my base is, and then I get it by itself by subtracting and dividing, what's the next step? What do you do after you get the base by itself? Yes. Rewrite as a log, right. Now you can either take the natural log of both sides or you can rewrite this. It actually doesn't matter because what is log base E anyway? Natural log, right. So this would become the natural log of 20 divided by 38.6 equals that negative 0 0.1947. So natural log of 20 divided by 38.6 equals negative 0 0.1947 T. And the last step to solving for T is that you need to divide by that negative 0 0.1947. So hopefully, we should get that for our answer, which if you plugged that into your calculator correctly, you should get about 3.38 hours or 3.4, whatever, however you round it is cool. Yes. That's a wonderful question. 
So the natural log of 20 divided by 38.6 is going to be a value that's less than one, which means the answer is going to be a negative exponent. So you'll actually end up with a negative on top and a negative on bottom, and they'll cancel out to give you a positive answer. There we were. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, good. All right, so those are ends that make sense. Yes. What if it had been a wildly huge number, like 96 hours? Does that make sense? No. Oh, what if it had been a negative number? Does that make sense? No. If your body temperature is 80 degrees before you die, you're close to it. Okay, that's not good. You're not healthy. All right. Okay, very neat. So, one thing I'm going to say before we wrap this up is stop, share, and record.